All right, this is Board Game Officer. So today we are going to go over Chronicles of Drunagor Age of Darkness version 1.5. Um, there's not an actual how to play video of for the version 1.5, um, so I figured I'll kind of go over it today. Uh, I am going to apologize first off because it is going to be through TTS, um, but I'm going to try and make it as least painful as possible. So overall, Chronicles of Drunagor, it is a cooperative campaign game. Uh, played over multiple sessions. Each session is going to be, you know, one to two hours. Maybe sometimes might go over to those two hours, depending on how long you cooperate and talk about your strategy. So about a one to two hour gameplay each uh, scenario. There are about 18 chapters, one chapter being a single scenario. And there are about 18 chapters within just the base game. Um, and then there are some uh, expansions that have come, come out and everything to add even more scenarios. Um, so the overall theme of the entire game is... It is, um, as a team, that you are trying to overcome the forces of evil that has overtaken this um, continent of, called Darren. Um, this evil darkness has started to spread around. And you are trying to, as a team, you're trying to go around finding the source of this darkness. This darkness has kind of created these monsters that come up out of um, people and dead things, right? It's kind of like this dark theme of, of the undead, I guess to say, right? Because the main boss is the undead king. Right, so there's a lot of like blobs and these weird of creatures of darkness that you're trying to find out where this darkness is coming from. We're going to start up with the setup of how to set up the game, how to choose your character, kind of go over the characters, and then we'll jump into the gameplay and kind of take it from there. All right, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to choose a hero. Now, as you can, if you've looked in the box, there's a lot of different type of heroes. So there's two different play mats. One is just, it's just what you prefer. There's no difference between the two. It's just what you would rather prefer. So this one is called the Deluxe. You've got your setup here, you've got your dungeon roll there, and then you also have your class abilities there. So as we zoom in here, you see there's a lot of abilities here. And these bottom abilities that have a lock on it means that you're gonna have a white cube to start off with on all of these ones that have a lock. That means when you start off the game, you'll only have access to uh, these ones without the lock symbol. So that, that, that's where the, you kind of have the benefits and disadvantages of both cards is this. You're going to have to place out all of these cubes every time for the ones that you do not have access to. And so these are going to be your abilities here. Um, just to kind of quickly go over each of these. Yellow is going to be your melee attacks or melee abilities. Red is going to be your ranged abilities. Green is your agility. And blue is your wisdom. Then also every character has two focus abilities, which are extra abilities you could do on top of your actions each turn by spending the appropriate amount of focus tokens. Also, you got your health, that one that's right out there, that's your starting health there. Your available action cubes go in that area, and then expanded that cube box there, so if you spend them to do other actions other than what's on your board, you just put them right there as they are expended. And last thing are your hero proficiencies. These are the equipment that you can hold. So as Jaheen, he can only equip light weapons, shields, plate armor, and trinkets by their appropriate side right here. You have your weapon, your offhand thing, which he has a shield for, your armor, which he has plate armor, and a trinket, which is something that every character has, can have any trinket. But these first three are all going to be different for each character. Then we have the class abilities here. Each time you're told to learn a class ability, you will come to this board. You will place a white cube on that very first one where that chain is. So as you can kind of see, it's kind of a tree here. That chain goes here, so this is level one. And then from here, after you've learned this one, you could go to either one of these. Or you have one like this, where that chain comes here for that first one. And then you have to go to this one, and then you have to go to this one. So you have a level two, level level one, level two, level three, when you learn. You do have to learn the first one before you could move on to wherever that chain is at. So this board is a, another board you just place your cube there to know that you have learned that ability there. So here we have uh, the other board. Now this one comes on the Kickstarter with a little mat or a little tray from game trays that you could actually put in because this one's gonna have a lot more cards but that way you don't have all the little cubes all over the place. So these are your starting ones, right? So right at the beginning, you can just pull this out 
And the abilities on your board are the abilities that you could do. Once again, it's got your health tracker there. You've got your focus abilities there. Um, available action cubes just go on the board there. And you have the expanded action cubes down here. As you can tell where that expanded action is at, it also has Path of Devotion. That each character is going to have their own path, which might come to play within different um, reactions or interactions that you do within the game, depending on what path you're on can change what you do. So just kind of pay attention to that. It is sometimes kind of hit, it's sometimes kind of hard to find there. You've got your light weapon, shield, plate armor, and trinket right there. And here, you've got it placed out to the side there. You start with the starting weapon, a we or starting weapon and a starting armor. Is all, you don't start with the offhand or the trinket at all. You just start with those two. So with these, when you level up, you're gonna have cards that actually you place out on your board. So if you wanna level up your melee attack, you could just place that one card there. Now you know you have access to that ability. If you wanna level up your range, you have your range. If you wanna level up agility, if you wanna level up wisdom. This way you, you only see what is actually available to you. If you want your level two, they're just on the backside. You flip it over when you learn the level two. You flip it over when you learn that level two. Right, so this way you're not, Seeing it on the board but not being able to use it. This is, is a way that you're only seeing what you actually have available to it. However, it's a lot more cards. So there's pros and cons to both because this one you have a lot of cards. The other one you have a lot of cubes out. So it just kind of depends. The other thing with this is your class abilities. Your class abilities also come in cards rather than that big card that you put the cubes on. So with these cards, as you can tell, as you can tell it has level one, level two, level two. Meaning once you learn level one, then you could go on and learn either level two that you want. Or then you have like this, level one, two, and three, meaning you have to learn level one, then you have to learn level two, then you have to learn level three. All right, makes sense. But same thing here, you will, because you can see all of them, you will just put a white cube, you know, over that spot, meaning that's the level one you know. But, you know, if you only have that one, these three cards you don't need out on the board, you know, so you can put them back in the box and wait till I actually learn them. So there's less out on the out in front of you because they're just cards and you'll have to bring out the ones that you need. Um, once again, just pros and cons between the two. The last thing here, and I, I forgot to show you on the deluxe side as well. So this is back to the deluxe side. Here are the dungeon rolls. As you can see, they also have the last two are all locked. Once again, meaning that you'll put the white you'll put the white cubes there to block off so you know that you can't do those two abilities. But it's just one single card that you can pull out that has the four abilities that you start off with. And then you can learn those, take them off, then you know you've learned them. So these are the deluxe version, so you can go with the big board. And then the other version are these cards here. So you will start with leader one and leader two right off the beginning. These are those four abilities, they're the same, they're just gonna be cards, right? That you can place in the board there in that tray slot that you could get from game trays. Now they have a third card, which once again, you don't start with, meaning you don't need to, meaning you don't need to put it out if you don't have that ability, but th this is an ability you could upgrade with, right? When you learn it, you put it on your board. If you wanna learn the second one, you just flip it over. Now you have access to both abilities. If you upgrade both of them, if you upgrade one, right? So this one is more about just being able to see what you actually have without covering anything up. This is so you have everything out in front of you at once and you don't have to worry about mixing out cards, flipping out which one you have which where. You just have to place little cubes to mark which ones you do not have access to. But everything is out in front of you at once. Which, right, positive and negatives, pros and cons of both, just depends on what you like. So now, once you pick your character, you look at your initiative card here. And as you can see, Jaheen has two yellow, one red, one green, and one blue. That means those are the cubes that you start with. So you grab the initial card, you grab the cubes that it tells you to start with, you put them in your available action. And then the next thing you do is you gotta choose the class or the dungeon roll that we were kind of looking at before. So I'm just gonna use these ones right here just to look at real quick. There's the defender, the striker, the leader, the support, and the controller. At the beginning of every single scenario, you can change which class do you want to, or which dungeon role you want to play as. 
So this is not set in stone from the very beginning. You, can, you guys can always switch it around, move it around, because um, some characters play it one role better than another role, role. So it might take some trial and error to see which one plays the best for you and for that character. So you will choose which one you want to be. And whichever one you choose, you will take that and put it next to your board. And now you have access to those abilities. The other thing that the dungeon roll does is it determines the initiative. So as you can see, uh, the initiative, you got the defender goes up, the leader goes up, and the controller goes up. But then you have the support goes down here and the striker goes down here. So that means whoever the defender is, you'll put his initi initiative card right here. So if we chose Jaheen as the defender, we would put his card there. Every time the initiative token would come here, he would activate. So the order in that way will always stay the same. The defender, the leader, the controller, then the support, then the striker. So the initiative track token is going to start on the top left hand corner go across and then it's going to jump down to the bottom and run across there so you're going to have to kind of look at what you want to go in the initiative track order as well when you're looking at the dungeon roll right the striker is going to be a striker so he goes last defender he's got a little bit more defense so he's going to go first so you you can kind of play around um once again you could change each scenario but you cannot change during the scenario so you kind of choose the order you want to go in at the very beginning of the game and then uh, you go through that scenario and you can change up as need be. One quick thing to know as well, where you can change between scenarios. So let's say you're the defender for the first three or four scenarios and you actually upgrade your shield wall. So now you know that. Now let's say if you want to switch the rules in the next scenario, let's say you want to become the striker. That means that level one will also already be unlocked. That means your striker will also look like that where that first one is unlocked. And if someone else becomes the defender, but if they have not learned the first level of that role, of any role, then theirs will still be covered. So your character will always learn. If you learn the level one dungeon role upgrade ability, you will always, as that character, have the level one upgrade ability of any role you play for the rest of the game, if that makes sense. So you don't have to worry about switching it, because if you switch, you'll still have that level one unlocked just on that different role. All right, now we're gonna go over how to set up for the fir very first scenario. So this is not much of a spoiler here because this is the very first setup of the very first chapter. I just wanted to kind of go over it so we understand what's going on with it here. It does say dungeon tray one. That means you're gonna take that dungeon tray that's a two by three right here. There's three dungeon trays. You're gonna get that first dungeon tray out and then you're gonna get card E4F right there. And you're going to place that right on top of there. And then that is making sure that your darkness symbol there is in that top left-hand corner. That's probably one of the best ways to orientate yourself, which, which way you're supposed to go, is looking for that darkness spawning symbol. And then finding chapter one, door one, and slotting into that slot right there. One thing that I love that they did with version 1.5 is they have this table space laid out right there. So that lets you know, do I need to set up in this corner? Like, where is this dungeon going to open up to, right? So this one shows if this is your table, set it closest to you right in the center because it looks like it might spread out both ways, right? So that's kind of gives you a, a inclination of how to set up on your table so you don't, so you know what type of table space you need, right? And it actually gives you actual dimension like, hey, you're going to need this much table space for this scenario just for the dungeon itself. And then all the other cards. So it kind of helps you prepare your table, which I think is super, super helpful. It's going to have these little asterisk symbols right here. And that is where your characters can start. So it doesn't matter where or who, any character start in any of those starting spaces. Then we're going to come over here to the spawning instructions. Now there's two things that they're going to do with the spawning. There's It has however many players. So if there's one player... This is who you're going to spawn. If you have two players, you're going to add this. If you have three, you're going to add that. If you have four, you're going to add, right? So each player on this one, at least, you're adding one per player. It's not always like that, but it will show you how that little two plus is however many players, two plus players, three plus players. You're going to add this. Now, the two things that are going to do is they're going to tell you a white monster. That's that WM is the white monster. And then they're either going to tell you exactly who to spawn. So this one tells you 
to spawn a skeleton archer at the rookie level. Or, like this one which has a GM, which is a gray monster, and then it doesn't specify which one. It just says rookie level. That means you're just going to shuffle up that de the, all the gray monsters, and you're going to draw randomly for whichever one you want. Now, with version 1.5, you have standard, alternate, and then some of them have a flip ability or the complex enemy. Those, once again, it's just totally random. It's never going to tell you to spawn the standard. It's not going to tell you to spawn the alternate or the flip ability one, the complex one. It's never going to tell you that. It's going to be completely up to you and your party of what you guys want to play. Usually, the alternate and the flip are a little bit more tough, usually. So, kind of... Maybe start off, start off with the standard before you go into them because they're going to be a little more complex and maybe a little bit harder. Not too much harder though, um, but they're at least more complex at least. Like here, let's say you're playing with four people. So you've got two random gray monsters. If it ever calls for the same color of monster, like white, gray, or black, and the same uh, difficulty, like rookie, fighter, champion, they, will always, they are supposed to be the same, right? So with this one, if you're playing with four people, you will randomly draw a gray monster rookie, and then that will be your monster for both this one and this one here. So you will spawn the same monster, you'll just have two of that monster for, for the board. That That is how it's said in the rule book, is you're supposed to do those the same. If they ever have the same color and the same level, then they're all just gonna be the same. That way you're not have like 15 different monsters out on the board. I mean, Basically, it just streamlines the process to get them out quicker. Um, and then we'll come to this board here. As you can see, each of these have a number that corresponds to the number on the left side here. So if you have just one player playing solo, you'll play with one skeleton archer right there in that corner, and then that's it. You could ignore everything else. Or if you're playing with more, your gray monster is going to go here. If you're playing with three, the third, the second skeleton archer will go there. Four, the second gray monster will go there. And five, the fifth, or the third skeleton archer will go there. So that's kind of how you set up for each scenario. Um, one thing is each door is also going to have something just like this on the setup. The only thing different is it's going to have a yellow arrow showing you where the door goes into. So as you can see, this is where the door goes. So right, everything is going to go up from here. So once again, this is kind of a spoiler, but I just kind of want to point out here, person right there. That means that's exactly where that door is going to open up to. And then it goes out from there. So that door is going to go right to that yellow space. That's where the two connect and then you continue on. So now we're going to talk about spawning monsters here. We're going to go over the card. What everything means on the skeleton archer here. So the very top, it's got that white symbol and it's got the white background, meaning this is a white monster. And then it's got the skeleton archer. Right underneath that is rookie, and this is the standard version. On the other side, it says rookie alternate. That's how you know standard versus alternate. Then on the left side there, it has immunities. That means that one right there is the bleed, meaning you cannot put a bleed token on the skeleton ar archer. So if you have any ability that says, you know, bleed two, bleed one, whatever, you just would not put a bleed on the skeleton archer because it is immune to it. Then we're going to go down right to the center. It's got the blue, that blue diamond there with a little white triangle on top. That means he's going to come here to the blue and go above the blue. And that's where he goes on the initiative track there. So as you go across, that's when he's going to activate. Then right underneath that blue symbol there, Right underneath, you've got that red target area, which means he's range. It means that he's always going to attack at range. He's a range character. We'll kind of go over there in a little, go over in a little bit what range looks like. But he is going to attack only at range. And then go to the right of that. And that nine there, that is his health. That means he's got nine health. Then we're going to go below that little line there. On the left side, that boot means he's got four movement. So on his turn, he will always move four. On the right side, you've got um, the two swords. With that three, that means he's going to do three damage every time he attacks. Now we're going to go to the middle. So the middle is always going to be their different abilities that each one can do. So this one is going to be multi-shot two. Multi-shot means that he's going to shoot two enemies and poison one. Now, I'll kind of cover this later as well, but multi-shot, because it's targeting every two people, it's... He's always going to target two people, but anything after that, 
any type of poison or second uh, secondary effect only takes effect if any damage is taken. So if he attacks for three and you block two of it, you'll get one damage and poison one. But if he does three damage and you block all three, that means you do not get poison one. I'll kind of go over the, with that, but that's going to be with for everyone, really. But so that is the enemy card there. Now we're going to come to the health tracker. So this is going to be the enemy health tracker. The base game comes with little base that you connect to with different colors. This is how you follow each of the health. So you will grab the skeleton archer mini. You'll place that yellow base onto that mini. And then you'll say that the yellow one has nine health. And you'll put that there. When you do damage, you just track this down all the way to zero till you kill them. So that's kind of how you determine each one's health is depending on their the base, the color of their base. Also, if with let's say you have two skeleton archers, you have two skeleton archers out on the board, one yellow and one is blue, and they activate. When you activate them, they will activate in the color order. So that means the yellow is going to activate first and then the blue skeleton is going to activate. So you're always, if there's more than one of a certain one, you always start at the top and then go down. We're going to go through a hero's turn now. So the nearest track token comes to your character. So now your character can activate. So on a turn, as it says right here, on your turn, you have three movement plus two action cubes. Two action cube actions. Meaning that you could use two of these action cubes to activate any two of these abilities. One thing I want to point out here with the expanded cube box is as an action, you can expend one AC to move three. So no matter what, you can always use one of your action cubes to move three. So instead of putting it on ability, you can just take that cube, put it into the, your expanded cubes area and move an extra three. So you can move up to nine right your basic three and then you can do two cube actions to move three but they do count as your cube actions so you can't move nine and then do other cube actions right they do count as a cube action um, but that's where you can kind of get more movement so let's go through these abilities real quick part we have protective light and then two swords that means anything with two swords means it's an attack whether it's melee or range doesn't matter it's going to have that Two sword symbol for an attack. A uh, weapon attack. It's considered a weapon attack. Um, doesn't really matter what your weapon is. It just means it's a weapon attack if it has that two sword symbol. Now, if it has the that little burst symbol on the left side there, that is a spell attack. So it's still an attack, but now it's a spell attack. Is this reaction, that lightning bolt, endure colon lightning bolt. That lightning bolt is a reaction. Meaning when an enemy attacks you, reactions are the actions that you could take to do something during that attack. So with this one itself, prevent three. Meaning if they get, if I get attacked, I can use any color of cube on this board to prevent three. So if they attack me, I thought I use any color of cube that I want and place it on there. And now I prevented three damage. So if I... So you minus, if they did three damage, you prevent three, so you don't take any damage. If they do four, you prevent three, you still take one. Is, right, weapon attacks we roll. The difference between the two, all spell attacks will have that burst symbol. You do not have to roll for spell attacks. Spell attacks automatically hit no matter what. For a weapon attack, you will have to roll a d20 to see if your weapon attack hits. To know what you need to roll to hit, you're going to look at your equipped weapon here. So as you see there, it has that D20 and then seven plus means it's a hit. So seven or higher is going to be a hit. So when you do a weapon attack, you roll. If you get seven plus, you will do whatever damage it has on your sword or on your weapon. So this, so when Jaheen uses his blooded sword, which is a light weapon, he will do three damage when he's attacks, which is the normal, that's the base damage for everyone. So we're gonna actually look at the attack here. All right, so I kind of zoomed up in here. So the protective light, then semi or colon, it's got the attack, meaning that's a weapon attack. Now we're gonna look. So grammar here is gonna be very important here, and that's why I kind of wanted to zoom up on here. So we have shield two, then a semicolon. Once there's a semicolon, it means there's a break. It means that, so shield two, break, so everything after that is considered the separate action per se. Meaning you're gonna shield two, 
And because it just says shield to does not say self, meaning you can shield someone else as well. So if I'm next to someone else, I can actually shield them too. But then it's semicolon, meaning, okay, that shield two is done. Now I'm going to go on to the next section, which is a plus two hit, comma, burn one. So because there's a comma, it means that those two wordings are the same action. Meaning I'm going to do a plus two to my hit. So instead of needing that plus seven, I will add two to whatever I roll. So if I roll a five, I get a plus two. That will equal that seven. So that's still a hit. And... The attack will gain burn one. So whoever I attack, if it hits, I will burn one. Once again, if it does not hit, that means that burn one will do nothing. So that's the difference between a comma and a semicolon. We'll go down to invigorating blow. We have heal three, semicolon, meaning he could heal himself. He could heal someone else. Then semicolon, meaning that action is done. Now I will choose another target to plus zero hit. So basically attacking someone, meaning, so the difference between that semicolon and that comma, meaning the comma, all of it is to the exact same target. So I can't do a plus two hit to this guy and a burn one to this guy. It all is part of one attack, one action, one person, whoever I'm targeting. But semicolon mean, it basically means I could choose another target for this next action. And the next part is an and. And is basically the same thing as a comma, meaning Hill three and shield two. Once again, because it's an and, I cannot choose two separate targets. Meaning I will choose one target to hill three and shield two or another target to shield, hill three and shield two. I cannot hill three this target and hill two this target, right? The and means it's one person, one target for both of it. I cannot split it up. Now, we also have not every character, but a lot of characters will have a 16 plus ability. So, we have this P means it's passive, meaning at all times, it's always going to be available unless you cover it up with curse cube, which we'll go over later. But 16 plus means it has to be a natural 16 plus. When you roll for any attack for anything, if it's a 16 plus, you will get this shield too. But once again, it has to be a natural 16 plus. So if you roll a 15 and have a plus two, even though it adds up to 17, you do not get the 16 plus. It has to be a natural 16 on the die or greater. All of the symbols, or not the symbol, that's all the grammar that we need to know within our abilities here. And then one thing I wanted to point out here too is like this one says up to two targets, heal two. So that means, right, it's a comma, but it says up to two targets means I can do that exact same thing, heal two, to both targets. So this guy's gonna heal, get heal two, and this guy's gonna get heal two. Now, last thing I want to go over here is range. Range is always going to be predicted by whatever, whatever cube you use. Meaning, since this is yellow, you have to use a yellow cube on this. And yellow cube is always only adjacent. It is a melee cube. So the shield two, he can do someone else, but that someone else has to be adjacent because they have to be within range of that cube to do that either attack or that ability of shield two. So because it doesn't say self, it will, he could do it to anyone. So just to show the self thing here, join the fray, it says self, comma, shield two, semicolon. That means self, comma, whatever's next, it has to go to yourself. It means you cannot try to shield someone else. This shield, you have to shield yourself, shield two, semicolon, move to, all move, if it ever has a move on your thing, it has to be yourself. Unless otherwise stated. But if it does not say self on move, it means self. You can't move other people if it says move. So move to semicolon plus zero hit. So once again, all three of those are going to be very separate abilities, separate things that you're doing. The next thing I want to focus on is because you get two cube actions, you have to go left to right before the next thing is activated. Meaning I cannot do my attack and then shield two. I mean, not much difference here, but a lot of times that might make a difference. You have to go left to right, and that is the way you activate your abilities. And I cannot do shield two, heal three, then go back and do my plus two hit. I place this cube here, I shield two, then I hit, and then I choose another ability, place my cube there, heal three, and then do another plus zero hit. So you have to do everything in order from left to right, and you can't start another ability until the one ability is completely finished. Now, 
let's talk about range. Range is going to be one blue square away. And I'll kind of go over the board here in a second. But that is going to be one blue square away. Now, you cannot do a ranged attack if you are adjacent to an enemy. Or it is called uh, engaged. If you are adjacent to an enemy, it means you are engaged. And you cannot do minor actions, except for a couple, or attack if you are engaged in combat. Or if you're engaged with an enemy. But there's no penalty to unengage from an enemy. So you can move away from an enemy and it's fine. But you cannot do ranged attacks if you are adjacent to an enemy or engaged. Agility and wisdom, they have no right. They have unlimited range. Meaning this hill three and burn two. Hill three, I could hill my buddy that's all the way on the other side of the board. Doesn't matter. If he's on the board, I could heal him. Even if I'm on one end and he's on the other end, I could heal him because it's blue or green and that's unlimited range. There's not really line of sight in this game either, so you don't have to worry about whether or not you could see him at all. If it's on the board, you could see him. No line of sight and unlimited range. They could be as far away as possible. Meaning, right, enemies don't block line of sight. Walls don't really because it's kind of a whole fog of war thing. So nothing really blocks line of sight. It's just on the board, unlimited range. And one thing I want to point out here as well with the multicolor thing here, meaning I can use any cube to activate stun enemy. I can use any cube to activate gravity push. And it's a spell, meaning I do not have to roll for it. However, because it's a multicolored ability, whatever cube I use is the range I have to be at to hit. So if I want to stun an enemy and I want to use a yellow cube, that means I have to be within yellow cube range, which is melee, which is adjacent. So I, even though it's a spell, I still have to be adjacent to the enemy if I use a yellow cube. Or if I use a red cube, I cannot be adjacent, right? Because if you're engaged, you cannot use a ranged ability. Meaning I cannot be adjacent if I use this red cube, but they can be one blue space away from me. Or if I use a blue or green cube, then it doesn't matter. They can be adjacent. They can be on the other end of the board. I can use right unlimited range, basically. So with these multicolored things, they have to be within that range. Whether, you're, whether it is to an enemy or if you are doing something to help a hero. Like this hill two and cleanse one. Right, this... Because it does not say self, you can heal and cleanse your buddy. If you use a melee, your buddy has to be right next to you. If you use blue or yellow, blue or green, it can be at any range, wherever wherever your buddy is, you can heal and cleanse him. So it doesn't matter whether you're targeting an enemy or an ally, your range color of cube you use de determines that range that it has to be at. So with the weapon attacks, because we are rolling, there are critical fails and critical successes. If we hit that critical hit, the natural 20, you do double the damage. That means after you add everything, if you have any plus damage, if you have any plus damage bonuses, you will add that before you double. So if you have a plus two damage or if you have a plus two damage and a fury token or you have anything to add damage to it, you do all that and then you double that damage. So you could do a lot more damage with the natural 20 or that critical hit. Now, one thing to talk about with double damage is you can only double damage with one ability and with a crit. Meaning if you have two or three abilities that double your damage, only it will only double once. The only time double damage will ever stack is if you have an ability and you roll a crit. That is the only time you'll get that double, double damage, basically like quadruple damage. Um, so that's the only thing with double damage is one ability and a crit is the only thing that can stack. Then the other one is a crit failure. What a crit failure is, is no matter how many plus to your hit you have, right? If, even if you have a plus 10 to your hit and you roll a one, that's still a failure no matter what. But that's it. You don't, before you had different rules, but with a one, it's just a natural, it's an automatic miss. No matter however many bonuses you have to your hit die, it's just an automatic failure and you go on to the next attack. Now, let's go over what I meant by this um, blue square here. So here I got one. I just kind of threw this out here just to show. So we've got Jaheen here. We've got a Skeleton Archer here. And here's a board. 
So we've got these little white spaces. These are going to be individual movements here. So one, two, three, right? That's our three movement there. Now range is going to be one blue square away, meaning for Jaheen, this square, this square, and this blue square is what he can attack. It doesn't matter if he's here or here. He can shoot from this blue square to any adjacent blue square, and that's a range of one. Meaning, Jaheen can step here, and now that skeleton archer is within range. Basically, everything is within range. If he's here, that skeleton archer is still within range. If he's here, it's in range, right? It doesn't matter where within the blue square you are, as long as you're one blue square away. Now, if the skeleton archer is here, even though he's still one blue square away, because he is engaged or adjacent to an enemy, he cannot do a ranged or a red cube skill against this skeleton archer. He will have to take a step back, and now he can attack the skeleton archer with a ranged cube or a red cube. But once again, there's no penalty to unengage from an enemy or to move away. There's no break attacks. There's nothing like that. No penalty whatsoever. You just have to make sure you move before you attack, which in this case, it seems like, a little thing, but when there's a lot of enemies, sometimes it's hard to get so you're not adjacent to any enemies. And this is still adjacent. So everything in this game is both orthogonal and diagonal, meaning movement can go one, two, three, totally diagonal. You can attack at any angle. Um, everything is every which way. It's kind of streamlines movement and thoughts and everything you have to do. Is, everything is orthogonal and diagonal that you can do. One last thing I want to talk about with movement and cube actions is once you move, you may do minor actions, which we'll go over here in a second, but you can do minor actions within your movement, but you cannot do a cube action. If you ever do a cube action, your movement will end and you cannot move anymore if you started your movement. So if I want, like here, if I had to move two to get into range and then attack him, because I moved here and then had to use a cube action, I kind of forfeit that last movement that I had. But if I started here, I could do a cube action and then move three and then do another cube action, right? So you could do movement between cube actions or before and after, but you cannot break up a movement with cube actions. If you're in the middle, if you start movement, you have to do the whole movement before any cube action, but you can do minor actions which we'll go over here now. There are six there are six different minor actions that you can do. The first one is if you are adjacent to another hero, you may exchange items. Meaning, as a minor action, you say, hey, let's trade anything that's in your pack. You could trade what's ever in your backpack for a minor action, as long as you're adjacent to that hero. Or you might have some interaction tokens. If you have an interaction token, there and you're adjacent to it, you may, as a minor action, interact with it. Meaning you, if there's two, you flip it over. If there's only one left, you take it off the board and you look at the door or the setup instructions and it'll tell you where what interaction to look at in the interaction book. So that's one minor action. Another interaction, or minor action, sorry, is opening a door. Once you're adjacent to a door, as a minor action, you can open it up, right? Like I said, minor actions you can do in between movement. So I can go one, open a door, set up, and then two, three, and keep going throughout through the door. So that's another minor action is opening doors. Next one is searching treasure chests. If you're adjacent, you can use that minor action to open that treasure chest, which to open a treasure chest, all treasure chests are going to be uh, trapped. You will have to roll this trap die. You have two blank sides, and then you have a burn, a fire two or burn two, poison two, bleed two, or a slow. So whatever you roll, that's what you get. Um, and then you can open it up and you draw from the treasure deck, from the top of the treasure deck, and then you discard the treasure. So that is a minor action. Once again, you can do that throughout your movement. Now, the last two minor actions are exceptions to the rule of being engaged. So everyone that we just talked about, exchanging items, interacting with interaction tokens, opening a door and searching a chest, you cannot do that while engaged with an enemy. The next two minor actions are 
Exceptions mean you can do them while engaged. The first one is using focus abilities. So throughout the game, you will gain these focus tokens. And if you have enough to, to pay for one of these abilities, you can discard that many and do that ability. Right? And a lot of times they're attacks or they're helping things. So that's why you can do that while engaged is a focus ability. And the last one is a, use a consumable item. Like this potion, it's potion of healing, consumable. That X means discard, discard to self heal six. So that means even though I'm engaged, I can, as a minor action, use this potion to heal myself if I need to. So using focus abilities and using consumables can are minor actions that can be used while engaged. Now with all these, you can do any or all of these minor actions in one turn, but you can only do one of each. So you can only interact once. You can only open a door once. You can only search one chest. You can only use one focus ability. You can only use one consumable item, right? So you can do all of them in one turn, but you can do each one only once. So coming back here to the board, right? So the first turn, we use this one and attack. Then we use this one and attack. They attacked us. And then one thing with the reactions as well, especially with the Jaheen here, he's got shield two. So let's say he's got four shield on him and he's attacked for three. Before using any action, he has to take, get rid of three shield. He cannot use any prevents. I mean, he can, it's just not gonna do anything because the shield's gonna go first. Even, right, let's say he has one shield and he's someone does three damage to you. You will break that. Even your prevent three would prevent all three. You have to get rid of that shield, two more coming in, and you have to prevent three to prevent the last two. So shields are always taken off first before any prevention um, happens. Back to using cube ability. So we got attacked, so we prevented three. Next turn, we did a gravity push and uh, up to two targets, heal two. So now we've used all of the cubes that we have. When we have, when we use that last cube, immediately we will immediately we'll take all cubes back, and that is called our unwilling recall. When we absolutely have to reuse the last cube, we have to do an unwilling recall, meaning bringing all of our colored cubes back, and then you have to take a cursed cube and you have to cover any of your abilities meaning that you will not be able to use that, right? So if I place my curse cube on that guy, I mean, next turn, I cannot use that ability because I have a curse cube on there. My only option is to use that blue one if I want to use one of those. I bring that back, we put a curse cube. A couple rounds later, we use all of them again. I will get another curse cube and you'll cover another one. And then you'll have to do another recall and you'll do another recall, right? And so you're covering up all these abilities, making it a little bit harder, right? Because that's all that darkness kind of coming over you. And if you have to grab your six curse cube, meaning you can have five curse cubes on your board. If you have to grab your number six, that's game over. That's how you lose right there. Now, how do we get rid of these curse cubes? So we have this ability. Everyone has this remove, remove curse ability. Every single dungeon roll has it. It's heal two and cleanse one meaning you will heal two, and cleanse one means that you will take one curse cube off your board. Also, another thing that everybody has is battle focus, which is focus one, meaning you will grab a focus token, and cleanse one, which means you could cleanse one, right? So that's how you have to get rid of those curse cubes is to cleanse. So another thing about, oh, so that was an unwilling recall, right? We use all the cubes. So we have to take a recall. Then there's a thing called willing recall, meaning at any time during my turn, I could recall all of my action cubes as long as I only have two colors left. So let's say I use all three of my melee cubes here. Now I cannot do a willing recall here because I have three colors, right? But let's say I used a blue and a green now, because I only have two colors left, I can do a willing recall to pull these two back. However, if you do a willing, and you still get a curse cube when you do a willing recall. However, if you do a willing recall during your turn, your turn automatically ends. So if you do one action and then want to do a willing recall, 
to you and your turn. You don't get a second cube action. So this is really, really important to do, um, to really pay attention to what you're doing because if you use, right, if you use all of these cubes here, like this, next turn, I don't have an attack, right? Because with these two cubes, now, I guess I could do gravity push, but if I need to do two attacks next turn, you know, I can't use that green one and that red one's not going to do an attack. So, after I use my two cube actions, before your turn ends, you can still do a wheeling recall, right? Because your turn is going to end anyway, so it doesn't hurt you in that way. But you are taking a cube or a curse cube, you know, two cube actions early. But another thing you want to, yeah. So you want to kind of pay attention to, to how you're managing all of your curse cubes and when to make that will and recall. Because if I have those two colors left, I'm going to go ahead and make that will and re will and recall, recall everything, and then that's the end of my turn and the next person's turn. Um, so so those willing and unwilling recall actions that you could take. Um, unwilling recall is also during any turn. So if someone attacks you, right? So if I only have one cube left and someone attacks me and I use it for my prevent immediately right then and there I'll prevent that three and then I'll get all of my cube do a unwilling recall and get another curse cube immediately even though it's not my turn willing recall has to be on your turn and it ends your turn as means immediately at after you do it whether you do it before your two act two action cubes or whether you do it after your two action cubes and after your movement it doesn't matter if you do a willing recall, your turn automatically ends. The last thing with cubes here, let's say you do die, right? You get attacked, you go down to that zero. What happens when you die? So if your hero dies, you're going to knock him over here. And right, just as a reminder that he's down, if you're knocked out, not dead, but knocked out, you cannot perform any actions. You cannot use any... Or you cannot be attacked. You can't be the the you cannot be the target of any attack or any other action or skill. Um, and you're going to re remove any negative effects like burn, poison, any of those negative effects. You're going to be take off your board. You're going to take a free recall action, meaning if you've got you know two of them on here. If I died, I'll take these back without taking a curse cube. A free recall action means that you recall everything with no curse cube. Uh, but instead of taking a curse cube, you are gonna take a trauma cube. A trauma cube is gonna be this purple one. What you're gonna do is you're gonna place this purple cube on any ability here. Now that ability will forever be blocked um, until the end of the scenario and you revive all your characters. But that means you cannot cleanse this ability. That Cube is going to block that ability for the rest of the scenario until you are until you go to camp phase again. And once you place that trauma cube down, you'll gain all of your health back and you keep going. Now, if you die the second time and have to get your second trauma cube, that is your second fail um, criteria. Meaning, basically, if you die a second time, game over, you guys all lose. So, you kind of have to you do kind of get two lives, but once you lose that first life, you're kind of hurt because you can't cleanse that. So you have to make sure you don't put it on ability that you're going to want later, right? Now, what if you were to put a curse cube or a trauma cube on a passive ability? If you put it on a passive ability, it means you do not get that passive ability anymore. So if I put a curse cube there, that means if I roll a 16 plus, I do not get that shield two anymore because it's covered with my curse cube, um, which makes sense. Now, one thing too with being knocked out, let's say I have one health and I have one poison. I have one poison on me, meaning at the very beginning of my turn, I die. What happens is we immediately get a trauma cube, get rid of all negative effects, get a free recall action, put our health back up to the top, put a trauma cube on, and continue turn. You do not lose your turn if you died at the very beginning of it when just doing the status effect stuff. Um, so you still get your turn. You don't lose the turn, but you just automatically die and re, uh, regain your breath is what they call it or catch your breath um, is what they call it in the rule book. One thing I want to mention here is sometimes you will have a pet um, in the game. If you have any a pet or companion, they will like once you finish your turn, then they will activate. So they do not have an initiative card to put onto the track. You just put that card next to you or you can put it on the 
initiative check to remind you, I guess, too. But that card is going to tell you what that companion does. And they will always activate right after your turn, whoever's controlling that pet or companion. They will not actually have their own turn. So, sorry about this. Not very good quality here. But this bear, it's got three movement, two attack, and that top right-hand corner shows that it is melee for this pet. Meaning he can move three. When he attacks, he attacks for two. And he will has to be adjacent because he's a melee character. And he will self-shield two every turn. Now... Pets, as well as enemies, which we'll go over here next, um, they move, then attack. They cannot attack and then run away. They will always do their movement first, then they will attack. Pretty straightforward and basic. They do not roll for their attack. They don't um, have to hit or miss. They just automatically hit for their attack. So one more thing about attacks I want to look at, talk about is advantage and disadvantage. As you can see, we've got a one level difference here. So if Jaheen attacks the Skeleton Archer, because he's one level above, he actually gets a plus two to his hit roll for his attack. Not damage, just to the roll. So he can hit him easier, right? Because he's got that advantage because he's up higher. However, the opposite is true. If Jaheen is down one level, he actually gets a minus two to his hit because he's at disadvantage down there. Now, advantage disadvantage does not do anything for the enemies, which I'll go over here in a second. Um, just for the heroes, it pluses to their hit. Meaning, if you do a spell, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to. There's no advantage or disadvantage to a spell attack because it just hits, right? There's there's no advantage disadvantage there because you're not rolling. But for weapon attack, you will get that plus two or minus two depending on who's higher or who's lower. So one more thing about level as well is you can see there's three different levels here. Now, to move from level 0 to level 2 costs one extra movement. So you will take 1, 2, 3, right? So it takes an extra movement. So you can move up there, but it will take one extra movement. But if you try to come down, it will take one movement still, but it will actually take two damage. If you voluntarily or if you get pushed or anything down two levels, you will get hurt for two damage. For one level here, it doesn't take any extra movement, and it doesn't take any damage going down. It's just going up. It's just normal movement to go up one level. But to go up two levels is going to cost an extra movement and two damage if you go off. So using that to like throw enemies off using telekinesis or push can actually be beneficial. Um, the only caveat with that is if you have a jump ability... You still have to use two movement or two jump movements to go up. But if you jump down, you do not take any damage. So if you have any jump ability, same going up, but no damage going down. All right, so now let's go over the enemy's turn. So the enemy, like I said before with the pets and the enemies, they will always move and then attack. They will never attack and then try to run away or anything. They will always move. They will move to whatever range they need. So he is ranged, right? And like this, he cannot be adjacent. So he will step back so he can attack. He won't move any more than he has to. He only wants to get within that range that he can be. So if he's back here, he will just go one, two, three, four. He's within range. He'll stop right there to attack, right? He's not going to go any further than he has to and still be within range. However, the first thing you're going to do is look at if they have multiple targets. So he has multi-shot two, meaning if there are two targets here and he's here, he will step back or he will stay there and he will attack both people. So let's say he's here, right? He's already within range one of this, of this Jaheen, but he can get within range two and he wants to get multi-shot two. So he will move so he can attack multiple people. So that's the first thing. If Do they have multi-shot or can they attack multiple people in multiple areas, they will try to get attack as many people as they can. They, you'll see if they have any of who they target. Um, on here, it doesn't say who they target. That means they will always target the strongest hero, meaning whoever has the most strength. As you can see on this other side, on the alternate, it's got Bloodseeker. That Bloodseeker, if you look it up, it actually means the one with the least amount of health. So that means his target is going to be, so you look to see who has the least amount of health, and that's going to be his target. If that target is within range, 
right? Let's say for whatever reason, um, uh, he can't. So if he's here and he doesn't have any more movement left and he, this Jaheen has the least amount of health, he can't get there, but he's already within range of this guy. So he will just attack the guy that he can, right? He's not going to just not do anything because he can't get to his target. He will try to get to his target. If he can't, then he will get to the next, um, the next least amount of health character, right? With Bloodseeker, trying to get the least amount of health. So if he can't get to one, he'll get to the next least amount of health. And the other way around, if he's getting the strongest hero, if he can't get to the strongest hero, he'll try to get to the next strongest hero, um, to the one that he can get within range with and attack. Now, last thing, not last thing, but one more thing is their attack. Just like the animals, they do not roll for their attack. Their attack hits no matter what, which is sometimes actually kind of nice because then you know what's going to happen. You could hold back your reactions, hold your cube so you know you could use your reactions because you know what's going to happen. You know that they're going to attack for three. And then, like I said before, that last part, poison one or bleed or anything that any of those secondary effects only take place if any damage is taken. So if he does three attack and Jaheen self prevents three, then that poison one will not happen. But let's do the same scenario, right? But with the alternate, if he attacks for four, Jaheen self prevents only three of it. Jaheen will take one damage. And because he still took at least one damage, he will also receive a burn one. So you grab a burn one token and place it on your tile. So that is how the, his attacks work. The last thing here with the enemies and who they attack. So this one, like I said, was Bloodseeker. So it's going to do the least amount of damage. If there's a tie, right? If two heroes have the same amount of health, then you will go with... So there, there's a lot of... I'm not going to go through all the things. You can go look those up, what each one means. But if it says to target the least anything, the least amount of cubes, the least health... The least means if there's a tie, whoever is the lowest or closest to the striker, right? The lowest or the slowest on the initiative track wins the tiebreaker or is the target of the tiebreaker. Now, just the opposite, right? The other side, if it's the most hero with the most amount of curse cubes or the most amount of action cubes, then it, the tiebreaker is going to be whoever is the fastest or the first on the initiative track. So the defender or anyone closest to the defender. Right, so that is how you do the tiebreakers. The most is the first in initiative, the least is the last in, in the initiative. And that's how you're gonna work on tiebreakers. Two more things with enemies. One is the pink. If anything is within the pink, that means it happens at the very first. The very first thing that happens, well, not the very first. First, you, if they have like poison or any conditions on them at, is first. And then the pink is first, shield two. Meaning he will shield two Always. He doesn't have to hit to shield two. It's just his innate ability at the beginning of his turn. He will shield two. The second thing is if your card says side A and side B, that means at the end of his turn, this card is going to flip to the other side. So this is, this is that more complex that I was talking about, right? It's going to flip back and forth. So one turn, it's on side A. At the end of that turn, it's going to flip over to side B. So the next turn, next time it the initial track comes to this, he's going to do something different. This time he's going to shield one, command, and then strike one. At the end of that turn, he'll flip back over to side A, right? So each turn he activates, he's going to be doing something different. So it really makes it a lot more complex, makes every turn different if the lasting for multiple turns, right? It really changes up the game. Now let's go over all of the enemies here real quick. As you can see here, this is not all the enemies, but this is just the base game ones here. We have white monsters, gray monsters, black monsters, and then we have commanders. And this is a difficulty level. White monsters are the weakest, gray monsters are the next strongest, black monsters are the strong, and then commanders are the really strong ones. One of the monsters that there is, is there is minions. These minions, they're still going to use the character that's printed on the card, right? So this one, you're going to use the Shadow Vampire minion or miniature, but this minion they're usually just a little bit weaker, not as strong, and the minions will always have their own abilities in the setup. One of the main ones is going to be this monster raid card. So this is also something new in 1.5 that it's not in all scenarios, but in some scenarios I'll have you place this monster raid card above the ruin on the track. So the monster ruin card will go here when you place it on the board. And what it's going to do is you're going to spawn minions according to what 
it says you need to spawn, right? One to two players, one minion, three to four, two minions, five players, three minions. Um, basically, on this side, if you have some other monsters, then you will spawn nothing. You flip it over, then it doesn't matter if you have monsters or not, you will spawn as many minions according to however many plays you have. Basically what this does, this kind of keeps you moving, keeps so you can't just sit there with no minions all the time. This will make it so you can actually keep going. It kind of gives you a little bit more of a push. But the minions are not as strong, so it gives you a little bit of push, but enough to still manage them. The next thing they have is they have Rookie, then they have Fighter. Um, I don't have any of the champions or the veterans, but underneath their name, it says Rookie. Underneath this name is Fighter, right? It goes Rookie, Fighter, Champion, Veteran. And difficulty as well. Basically, their movement goes up, the attacks goes up, the abilities, I mean, as you can see here, this Shadow Cultist goes from 3 movement and 4 attack to 3 movement and 5 attack and 12 health instead of 9 health. Right, so they get more health, they do a little bit more damage. Sometimes they'll add, like this one's burn 1 and curse 1, they'll kind of add maybe a curse 2 once they get us the champion veteran. Right, they're just going to up in health and attack and abilities. Basically just get a lot stronger as they go up in difficulty. The next thing I'm going to go over is Commanders. So they've actually changed Commanders quite a bit, and I really like how they've done Commanders. So here's the Commander card. It looks just like an enemy card. However, if anything ever has X on it, that means whatever, however many tokens are on the initiative track. And I'll go over this next, but we're going to, throughout the game, you're going to get these tokens on the initiative track here. As you can see, this Commander has, he sits above the gray. So however many of these tokens that we have on the gray is going to be that X. So he's going to have X movement. So if there's two tokens there, he'll have two movement. If there's four, he'll have four movement. And he will fatigue X, meaning if there's four, he will fatigue four. All right. So anything that has X on it correlates to however many tokens are on that um, color that he sits on. Now, this is where the, comp the probably the most complicated part comes is with our health. It says eight R. That R is going to go to the spawning instructions. So I don't want to spoil anything with you, so I'm not going to find one that shows it. But in the setup, it's going to have something to this effect. CP, which is combat power or commander power, I think. It's not like that. But P CP is 1, 1 plus P. This 1, it, that's what's going to change on, on everything. P is for the amount of players. So the commander's power is going to be 1 plus P. So if we're playing with two heroes, it's going to be 1 plus 2. So CP is going to be 3. Then you come here and you plug in 3 or you 3 times whatever's on there, which is that 8. So 3 times 8. So that means this commander's health is going to be 24. Now, what I really like about that is that means later down the road, right, with this commander... If that's always going to be 16 to 24 health, whether you fate this commander on scenario, on scenario 2 or scenario 18, right, his health will always just be 24, which is a huge difference between scenario 2 and scenario 18. But what they have done is in the spawning, instead of having a 1 right there, they'll have like a 3 in chapter 17. So instead of it being um, two plus, or 1 plus 2, it's going to be 3 plus 2. So that means it's going to be 5. 5 times 8, so now his health is actually 40 instead of 24, right? So that way they can kind of scale it within their, whenever you spawn them in their spawning instructions, they can actually scale it to be harder depending on what other, whatever level you're on. So that's, it's a little bit more complicated because there's an R, then there's a CP in the spawning. So they don't correlate with like, I don't know what the R means actually, um, but basically that R means you go to the setup and look at the CP, 1 plus player, and then you times whatever that equals by the 8, the CP plus times the 8, or whatever the health is on there to get their health for the commander. So their commander health is always going to change and move around. Now the last thing you're going to do for the commanders is you're going to have this commander attack deck. So you're going to shuffle it, and then you're going to draw as many plays as you have. So if we're playing with two players again, you're going to draw two cards. As you can see at the bottom middle, it has a down arrow and then a blue. So we're gonna put it below the blue and we're gonna draw another one. As you can see, it has an up arrow and the orange, it means it's gonna go above the orange. 
Now, when the initiative track comes to these, whatever that is, is going to activate. This does not count as the commander's activation, right? So if he has like burn or something, he does not have to take that because it is not the commander's turn. This is stuff done outside of the commander's turn. But anything that needs range or anything, it's coming from the commander, if that makes sense. So it's not his activation, but it's still coming from him. Meaning, so this is passive, the commander gains immunity to burn, and then attack. This attack targets two weakest heroes at any range, dealing burn X and slow to them. So even though we're, the, it's attacking, it's not the commander's turn. It is the, this card, it's kind of an extra little thing for him. And at any range, meaning it's coming at any range from the commander. So at any range, it doesn't really matter. But if it were to say within one range or adjacent, it would have to be adjacent to the commander. So at any range, you're going to do burn X, which if there's one, you'll burn one and slow. And then this commander card, this attack targets the two most corrupted heroes at any range, dealing X damage to them. So it will do as many, right? So if there's no blues, it won't do any damage. So that means nothing else will happen, right? It'll just do some damage. So that's how the commander works, right? So the commanders are going to be kind of like bosses because the bosses have their card as well, but it's only tailored to however many heroes you actually have. Um, there, then there are overlords, um, which are just like commanders. They'll have their own overlord deck instead of a commander attack deck, um, but they work just the same. They're just a little bit more difficult than commanders. So if you want to try to up your the difficulty, using overlords versus commanders will up that difficulty, but they work just the same. Um, they'll have their own cards and they'll uh, have their own deck as well. So they're just a little bit more complicated. Now, the last thing is the boss. So bosses do not do not have any type of initiative card in that sense of like the enemies or the commanders or the overlords. What they do have is they have command cards or attack cards, right? And there's always five of them, meaning there's going to be one on each color. So this is the very first encounter. I'm not going to go through them because I don't want to spoil too much. But this is the first encounter. You're going to, right? You're going to play it, lay all these out on the board where it tells you to. And so every time it hits that, you're going to do whatever that card says. And that is how the enemy or the boss activates. I mean, he's technically kind of getting five turns every round, right? So the bosses get pretty intense. Um, the health is going to be in the setup instructions. Here we have the boss set up here, right? This is going to be the health, you know, all the way up to 900 health, um, right? So if it's 55, that's how you do their health, what he's immune to up there. Um, this is how you're going to track the boss's health. And then each boss, there's other bosses and expansions. They'll come with their own board. Um, this is the Undead Kings. Um, boss or map that comes with the game and it's just on the back side of the um, enemy board now we're going to go over the darkness spawning you always or you, depending on what it says in the beginning of the book um, you're going to have this darkness hunting or some type of darkness spawning rule this is the basic one here is it's going to go right there at the end of the rune track and when the initiative track hits that you're going to do whatever it says. You're going to draw one rune and then flip this card over. The next time you're going to draw two runes and then flip this card over, right? So you'll do one, then two, one, then two. Now, when it tells you that you're going to, to draw one ruin, you're going to come over here to the back here and you're going to draw one out. It's going to be gray and you're going to flip it over. That is the tile that you're going to grab or the shape of tile. So I'm going to grab one of these and I'm going to place it on the board. Now, when I come to the board, that's where these darkness spawning points are going to come into play. There, this darkness is going to spawn on any one of the either one of these points here in any direction. And it is going to try to grow towards the strongest hero. So if this is the strongest hero here, it is going to try to get as close as it can to him. Now, this is where it this is new to 1.5. As you can see. This does not reach this hero here with this little L. If it does not reach a hero or if it cannot be placed on the board, right? If the tile is too big, it will break into three different pieces, individual pieces, right? So now we have these three pieces. If it, does, if it could reach the hero within those three pieces, 
it will switch into those three pieces. So this does not reach him while it covers that up. But if I had three individuals, it would. So that means you trash that three. And so this hero is now on darkness. Now what happens when we're, we're on darkness, each turn you're, you enter darkness tile, you will get two damage. Undefendable, two damage. Or irreducible. Meaning no shields, you can't use any prevent, nothing will happen, you have to take the two damage. So, during this phase, if this gets on me, this Jaheen will take two damage right off the bat as soon as that happens. We have that gray one, we spawn it on the board, now we place it on the board here, and that is how these are going to start being powered up. The more runes we draw, the stronger the bosses and commanders are going to be. Okay, so that's the point of those. Now, if we have to draw two runes, we're going to draw one at a time here. We'll draw a green one, and now it has to be a long one. So we'll take this long one, and we'll come over to the board here. Now, since he's already on darkness, it is going to go to the next strongest hero and try to get him. So it'll come there. As you see, it cannot get him. If we broke it into three, it still would not get him. So we just lucked out there that we did not get onto darkness. So that was the first one. Then we draw our second one, and when it's another gray with that little diagonal zigzag. And now we can, it will fit on the board and get the hero, so it'll go like that. And that is, and then this Jaheen will take two damage because now he is on, on darkness. So that is how spawning works. And we will put, we'll put both of these on the initiative track as well. So let's say we have to draw one. If we have to draw a ruin, and we are both already on darkness, right? So it can't try to get to us because we're already on darkness. Then we get what we call a crush damage. So we will draw a rune and put it on the board or on the initiative track still. However, we will not put anything on the board. What we do is you take crush damage, which is as many heroes as there are. So if we have two heroes, we will each get two damage. If there's five heroes and all five of us are on darkness, then we'll take five damage. Right, but it's it's a lot less likely for five people to get on darkness, but if it happens, you're hurt a lot more. All right, one last thing for spawning the darkness here. So let's say we have to spawn this one, right? And there's no way for this to fit on the board. This is the second reason that we're going to end up splitting it into three. Now, there's two different things here that we're gonna do. If he is the only hero on the board, or the only hero on the board that is not on darkness, we're gonna break this up and we're gonna put one down, and that's it, right? Because the darkness doesn't have anywhere to grow to because there's no other heroes not in darkness, so you just put one tile down until you meet that. Now, let's say we had a second hero over there. Once it gets placed on that hero, if there are more tiles of those three to be put out, you will continue to grow towards the next hero, so then both heroes get on it. So it'll go to the one, and then it'll keep growing to the next strongest hero. If there's no more strongest heroes, you only put out as many tiles to get to that last strongest hero, and then no more tiles are spawned. Now, the other negative of darkness is if you ever if you ever attack while on top of darkness, you get another minus two to your attack. So, if I, if I have a ranged attack here, I'm going to roll, but I'm actually going to get a minus one to my roll because I am on top of darkness. I need to move off of it before I can attack. They do stack. So, let's say I'm down here and attacking him. I will actually get a minus four to my attack because I am both below him and on top of darkness. So, they do stack in that sense. Also, the other negative is the enemies get a plus two damage to their attack. So if he only does, if he's doing four, but if he's on top of darkness, he will do eight or six damage because he does plus two. So the enemy will always try to get on top of darkness, right? So if Jaheen is here and he's here, he, the skeleton archer is going to move so he can attack both heroes and be on top of darkness. He will not just stay here because he's already within range. He will move to darkness if he can and still hit both targets. Now, if he could not hit both targets while being on top of darkness, then he will not be on top of darkness. He will prioritize two heroes over darkness, but he will try to be on top of darkness if he could hit both or his target. One other thing with darkness, also with terrain, which we'll go over next, is you that minus two damage or whatever negative it is to any terrain, 
you get once per turn. It only can happen once per turn. So if it's Jaheen's turn and he moves one, he takes two damage. If he keeps moving in darkness, nothing else happens. He already took the damage this turn, so he doesn't have to do it again because you can only be hurt damage each turn. Now, that is turn, not around. So if I move, so during Jahi's turn, if he moves one, gets hurt two damage, and then keeps going, right? That's fine, whatever. Now, if the skeleton goes next, and the skeleton or whoever enemy has like a telekinesis or a push, and pushes me or moves me during his turn, that is a separate turn. Therefore, I will take two damage again, because it is a separate turn. Now, if he moves me three, one, two, three, it was still only minus two damage because you can only get that negative once per turn, not per round. So you can use that. So it kind of hurt, but you can actually use that to your benefit um, for other trains, which we'll go over next. So here we have the different trains. So this darkness train is going to act exactly the same as the train tiles that you put out on the board. It's still darkness. It still gives that minus two damage. Water is you're going to minus one movement. It does not. Now, this is an important clarification. It does not cost two to move in. It minuses one movement. What I mean by that, if you are in water each turn, you will have to minus one movement for the first step. So if he's already in water, he starts in water here. His first step, he'll go one then he'll have to minus one, so then he only moves one more, and that's his three movement. Now, the important thing about that, at minus one versus cost two, is if he's his if he moves right one two, his third movement can be onto the water because he has to minus one movement. He doesn't have any left, so it doesn't hurt. So your last movement can be on water. So we can go one two three for his last movement. So once again, it's just that very first step. So if you use like two move three abilities, you'll one, two, three, then you use another one, one, two, three, one. Now you can move as much as you want this turn. You can move as much as you want within there. But that very first turn, you're gonna lose one movement. So same thing with here. As you can see, the spikes, you're gonna bleed to. So that means the first step into here, you're gonna bleed to. But if you keep moving, it's fine. You're not going to bleed anymore. Unless, and this is where it could come into handy with, you could push your telekinesis enemies because if they move in to hear their turn, they're going to bleed too. And then if you move them again, like telekinesis, they'll bleed too again. And that is where you could really use these to your benefit. Um, the next one is this poison, right? You're going to poison to your first step of each turn. And then the last one here, the lava is burned to, is for every, the first step of each turn is going to be burned to, or if you end your turn on any of these spaces. So if I'm right here at the beginning of my turn and I move out of it, I don't get anything that turn because I moved out of it that first turn. But if I step into it, then I will get that burned to. Or if I end my turn, so if I decide not to move, and if I don't move at all, then at the end of my turn, if I'm still in here and I have not received that penalty yet, then I will receive that penalty at the end of my turn. So that is the terrain. All right, so we're going to go over um, the majority of these tokens here. It's not going to be all of them, but at least these are going to be the most common here. Right? We have stealth, which is going to hide you from enemies. Um, slow, which is going to minus two from your movement. Burn, so burn is going to be the main different one here. At the beginning of each round, however many burn tokens you have, you will take that much damage and then only get rid of one token. So if you have four, then at the beginning of your turn, you will take four damage and minus one. So the next round, you'll take three damage and minus one. Then you'll take the next turn, you'll take two damage minus one. Next turn, you'll take one damage minus one. So they kind of stack on top of each other in that way. However, bleed, however many bleed tokens you have, you will take that much damage at the beginning of your turn, and then you get rid of all of your bleed. So bleed happens, and then you're done. Then the next one is poison. The poison, however many poison you have, you'll take four damage at the beginning of your turn, and that stays on it. That does not go away at the beginning of your turn ever. The only time it ever goes away is if you use a cleanse ability. If you cleanse one, 
you get rid of a curse cube and you will clean any poison. You do not clean anything else. You do not clear anything else. It only cleanses the poison. So if you have burn and bleed, it does not get rid of those, but it will get rid of any poison that you have on your board. All of it, not just one of them. It will get rid of all poison on your board. The next one is knockdown. Knockdown, you have to spend your, your whole movement action, whether that be one, two, or three movement, your whole action movement to get to stand back up. Stun for the heroes means you only get one cube action. For the enemies, it means they get no attack. They will still move, but they get no attack. Intimidate means you minus however many intimidate you have um, to your next attack. You'll do that less mu that much less damage. And then shield, right? You shield you minus that damage taken to you. Now, any of these ones with numbers on it. You can have up to four mats of any of them, whether it be bleed, fire, poison, intimidate, shield, anything with a number on it, even the focus, you can only have up to four. Everything else without a number, you can only have one of. So if you have slow and someone tries to give you slow again, it does not stack. It just, you just keep the slow, nothing happens. Um, the only thing that stack are those with numbers and it only stacks up to the max of four. There are some things that let you have more, um, but more or less four is the max for any token that you have on your board. If there's a number on it, if there's no number, you can only have one of it and they will never stack. All right, so after you finish the adventure, you come to the end, it says you may go to the, the camp phase. The camp phase is here. It's on the backside of the first monster status board and health. And it actually gives you step-by-step -step of what you do during the camp phase. So it's actually super nice. Um, if you want more detail, you can go into the book and it'll give a little bit more detail here. Um, but you remove all your conditions, um, everything. You basically just start fresh with everything. You take off all conditions, shields, positive and negative, negative conditions. You remove all curse and trauma cubes. Um, you recall all your action cubes. You recover all your HP. Um, you erase any statuses from your campaign log, ors or outcomes. We'll talk about that next here. Um, you receive the reward described in the book. In the book, it'll tell you, you'll either get a camp item, um, you will, uh, yeah, a gear, you either get new gear, a new action cube, or a new class ability. Um, and then you can stash or retrieve any adventure, adventure items um, that you want to. However, you cannot stash any treasure items. So if you have more potions or anything, those are just discarded at the end of the camp phase. At the beginning of the camp phase, you cannot stash those. But any equipment or anything you found throughout this scenario, if you keep it in your pack, you can stash it once you get to the camp. So if you could trade it out later if you maybe want to. So the camp phase is pretty straightforward. Um, you basically just refresh your, your character. Now, I want to go over the rewards. So if it says to learn a skill ability, that means you're going to grab one of these cards here. Or if you use the deluxe board, you're going to take, you're going to remove one of these white cubes, basically. Now, you always have to do, with the, these cubes, you always have to do the top row before you can do that second row. So this is a level one, this is a level two, right? So you have to do one of these first. Um, before you can ever learn a level two. Um, but it will specify learn a level one skill or learn a level two skill. So if it says learn a level one, you have to learn one of the level ones. If it says learn a level two, you can only learn the level two of the one that you've already learned level one, right? So if I learn this one and then it says learn a level two, I cannot choose one of these. I can only choose that one, right? What you're gonna do is you're gonna choose one of these to remove. And that includes your dungeon roll. That includes one of your skill abilities that you can upgrade to, right? So I could get that shield wall, or I could get one of these rage shields, blessed recession, forgiveness, or repelling strike, right? I can also get any one of those. Now, once you receive, or once you choose whichever one you take, you remove that white cube, or you gain, or you grab that card. Now, whichever one you grab, you get an additional cube of that color. So because I chose a melee cube, I will get one extra melee cube. So now every time I play, I have three melee cubes, right? So you're gonna gain cubes every time you gain a skill ability. Let's say you chose this ability. Since it's a multicolored one, it means you could do either one of those. So I could gain a melee or a ranged cube. I could choose either one. Same thing with here. If, it's, if I learn this one next for level two, I could gain one of any color, yellow, red, blue, or green. 
where this one I could get a yellow or a red. Right, so you could gain whichever color. If there's multiple, you choose whichever one you want to gain. If you ever gain any equipment, they, a lot of them are also going to have this cube spot. You do not get any cube for equipment. Equipment is just equipment you add. You do not gain any more cubes for any equipment you gain, only for the skills that you learn. Now, the last thing you'll upgrade to are your class abilities. Now, this is where I was talking about before. You will choose a level one first. The next time it says a class ability, you could choose a level two or you could choose another level one. For the class abilities, it will not specify a level one or level two or level three. It'll just say learn a class ability. And you can learn any of them as long as you've learned the one above it first. So I can learn this level one, then this level two, then this level two right in a row. Or I could learn this level one and then this level one and then this level one for the first three class abilities, right? So there's no restriction on level one versus level two as long as you've learned that first one first. Where with the skills, it will specify to learn a level one or to learn a level two, but it will not for the class abilities. And the class abilities are usually persistent, um, right? You suffer no damage from darkness. That means you won't get that negative two damage for the rest of the game. Like that's just a passive. All of these are always just passive or whenever it says it, you know, once per turn or plus one to hit for every two shield that you have, You right? So they're kind of passive abilities that you have as long as you have that cube on there. Now, the last thing I want to talk about that kind of has to do with the camp phase, sometimes there are going to be what they call sequential adventures, meaning not after every scenario are you going to come to this camp phase. Meaning, if you don't come to this camp phase, you're not going to get rid of all your trauma and curse cubes. You're not going to restore your hero back to full health. You're not going to do that. So you need to make sure that you're paying attention to what your characters are doing and everything. Because they will, at the end of the adventure, of any sequ sequential adventure, it will state what you do restore. Because you will still take the reward at the end of the adventure. You'll still take a free recall action. Um, you'll put that rune card back up to face A. Um, you're going to, right, you're, you're going to, basically, it will step through everything that you're going to keep. So you restore a little bit, but not everything. So you have to kind of manage your heroes in that way um, if you know it's going to be a sequential adventure. So the last thing I want to talk about here, I kind of went over all the rules, the basic rules. However, this will be at the beginning of every single chapter, and this will change, or this will supersede anything that I just talked about. Right, so darkness spawning rule means that rune card that we talked about actually doesn't even start at the beginning of this adventure because it says so here. Even though I'm, we're supposed to, it says that we're not supposed to. The darkness behavior is going to be standard. The recall penalty is you receive one curse cube as a penalty every time you take willing or unwilling recall. And then it gives you your winning and losing an adventure and to start the adventure you set up. So there's just going to be different rules for each scenario. Um, a lot of them will be the same, but sometimes it will change. So you have to make sure you read this before each adventure so you know what rules are changed and how it's special for that adventure. And there you have it, folks. That is uh, Chronicles of Juno War 1.5 version. Um, let me know if there's something that I missed or something that's confusing. I can put little subtitles in there to help clarify things. Um, I hope that was understandable. I tried to do it in a succinct order so it was all understandable. Um, let me know what you thought. Hopefully it's not too bad with the TTS. I do apologize for that. I went for a wave two shipping, um, so I'm not going to get it till July. That thing just came out today. Um, that hopefully they're hoping by July. So I'm not getting mine till July yet. So, um, but I've played a whole lot with my friend and on TTS. So, I absolutely love this game. Um, let me guys, let me know what you guys think. And thank you so much for watching.